All right, guys, here we go into the Big Ten, back to it. I, I, There's been about four times this week that I've thought about this being the Big Ten opener, and then I was like, oh, yeah, there was that Indiana game. <laughs> but this almost feels like the Big Ten opener after playing three non-conference games. Uh, Steve, we'll start with you in regards to uh, your initial take on uh, this Maryland Herps team. You know, um, I watched – a good bit of the game against Indiana. I was driving around and was listening to the first part of it on Sirius. And, um, you know, I listened to their pregame show and they actually have a pretty good football team this year. It seems like, um, you know, this is a big step up in class. I think obviously it goes without saying they've played Towson. Uh, they had a struggle for a half against Charlotte in a prime time game on NBC of all places. Um, and then they came through that one with flying colors. They blew out Virginia, which I don't think has won a game yet. I think they're 0-5, which is crazy that Virginia hasn't won a game in its mid or you know, early October. Haven't won a home game in two years. Oh my gosh. In the ACC. Yeah, they got to do something about that. So uh then uh obviously they went to Michigan State, Michigan State program in complete turmoil beat them 31 to nine at Michigan state kind of humbled them up there. And then last week uh, at home, they were up 27 to three at halftime against Indiana, never gave Indiana much of a chance. I don't know what the final score of that game ended up. I, I apologize. I don't have that. 44, 17, 44, 17. So representative second half, they got some other guys playing time and uh, still won the second half. So uh, to me, that that was a big step forward for them as well. Everybody knows about Tylea Tagovailoa, their outstanding quarterback. He is their career leader. Uh, he's started roughly 33 games, I think, now for uh, Maryland over the past two and a half seasons and is their career passing leader, career touchdown leader, and some other stuff as well. Just had a bang up, you know, a, a great career there already. And, you know, this was a team that was eight and five last year. And, you know, they're they're trying to punch above their weight a little bit and trying to show it's a miscarriage of justice that they're not in the top 25 this week. But the voters kept LSU at three and two in there. Now, LSU has played, you know, and lost, I mean, to, to some good teams, Florida State and Old Miss. They've, they've lost to better teams than anybody Maryland's played. So, you know, rate that however you want. But Maryland's right behind them at number 26. So Ohio State gets no credit for playing a current top 25 team this week, even in the coaches' poll. They're at 26 in that as well. But they are a quality opponent. Probably the best Maryland team that Mike Loxley has put on a field yet in his uh, six, seven years, whatever it is, as the Maryland head coach. So, I am enthused and excited about this game. Um, You know, Maryland's given them a couple competitive games over the years. Ohio State's dominated the rivalry for the most part, uh, 8-0. They did not play in the COVID season. Uh, That's why there's, instead of nine games in the the series, there's only been eight. They never played prior to uh, Maryland joining the Big Ten in 2014. So, um, it's an intriguing thing. And uh, I, you know, eight and five last year, they won the Duke's Mayo Bowl over NC State. Uh, last year, they went to Michigan. They gave Michigan a really good game and lost by seven points, I think, at Michigan. Got stomped by Penn State 30 to nothing and then lost at home to Ohio State 43 to 30 in a game that was roughly, I mean, Ohio State trailed at halftime in that game. And it was roughly a one score game either way for about, you know, 45 or 50 of the 60 minutes. I think Ohio State grabbed control in the second half and then Maryland cut it back to a to a one score game and had the ball at the end. But then a defensive touchdown for the Buckeyes made it 43 30 in the final seconds. Not sure how that registered on the bad beat meter there, if if that impacted the spread or not. But uh, Buckeyes almost a three touchdown favorite to take care of business on Saturday at the shoe against Maryland. Yeah. um, I've looked at this game a couple of different ways, uh, broke down something I just posted over at Buckeye huddle 
uh, broke down Talia Tagovailoa and how he Tagovailoa and how he compares against other quarterbacks on Ohio State's schedule, ones they faced, ones they've yet to face. We've come a long way since 2017 when Maryland was 3 of 13 passing for 16 yards. Then again, it wasn't much better running the ball, 42 carries for 50 yards. So uh, Was that we, Bortenschlager? Was he on that team? I'll that have a was, shot of the Bortenschlager. That, I mean, you know, I mean <laughs> – uh, tie a pig rome. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, they couldn't keep, they couldn't, they couldn't keep quarterbacks healthy at that point. And interesting factoid. And what does this have to do with this week? Nothing. But Ohio State's margin of victory over Maryland in Columbus is forty-four point three points per game. Ohio State's margin of victory over Maryland in College Park is just twenty-five point three. So we're talking almost twenty-point differences. But it all comes into into matchups and where everything is at that point. Uh, Maryland hasn't played anybody, but over two games against Ohio State, we have seen Talia pass for, I believe it's 71.2% completion percentage. Granted, 21 was, you know, we were getting down into the depths of Ohio State's secondary not being so hot. 22 we saw some, you know, they were making progress, but they still had those big plays baked in and big plays did happen. So I'll be interested to see what, what 23 is. I mean, I do see some fool's gold when I do look at Maryland in certain aspects that I think Ohio State can exploit, but I'm not ready to say that I'm willing to lay the points at this point either, because there's still a lot of unknowns. You know, um, the the interesting thing looking at Maryland's quarterback situation, like there is a, an alternate timeline where Tristan Wallace stays committed to Ohio State and Dwayne Haskins stays committed to Maryland. And those guys are both part of the 2016 recruiting class. And you know, you, there wouldn't have been a Max Bortenschlager. You know, Perry Hillis would have done his you know couple of years as a starter. And then it would have gone to Dwayne Haskins, and then it probably would have gone to Talia Tungavailoa, and it would be a very different Maryland time frame in there. And just looking at some of those quarterback names, you know, we didn't even mention Kasim Hill there at Maryland, and I don't even remember. Um, I think in 2019, Josh Jackson. I have no recollection of of him, but they'd always have like two guys throw for like 800 yards over the course of a season because they couldn't stay healthy. It wasn't that long ago they were, what, had a linebacker playing quarterback because they were down to like their fifth or sixth guy. So it does give you some wonder, like, what happens when Talia is gone because you can almost put the entire program on his back in terms of this resurgence. Because right now I think I think they have a claim as the fourth best team in the Big Ten. And if they were in the Big Ten West, they'd be playing for a Big Ten title. But here they're playing for fourth place in the Big Ten East. And it's unfortunate, but you know, it's one more year of this, and then they can be free of the shackles of the Big Ten East and then be happy that, oh, gosh, now you've got Washington and Oregon and USC and, and uh, UCLA to deal with as well. If I remember the Josh Jackson year and the fool's gold that year was Josh Jackson played for Virginia Tech in the, the mm -hmm. ACC championship game. He was a pretty decent quarterback, big guy. And then he comes to Maryland. People are excited and they blew the doors off of Syracuse and Syracuse had had a decent season the year before so that they scored like 63 points and then had like a Wagner kind of win. And then after that, they went south they, and uh, that they lost to Temple. They lost at Temple the week after the big win over Syracuse. OK, yeah, then it must have been like a zillion points in week one against whomever a Towson, probably Howard probably Towson. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's uh, they posted uh, two 100 yard receiver efforts. Jashawn Jones was their number one receiver in terms of yardage and receptions last year. And Ty Felton turned in a buck 34 with three touchdowns and a 46 yarder against uh, IU last week. So, yeah, is this the Maryland team that it's been from a skill position standpoint and defensive backs, but a much sturdier team up front on both sides of the ball? That's the. That's the major question to be asked and answered. 
for yeah, sure. Yeah, and they're, they're, they're not much of a running team either. Now, somebody I'm sure will be quick to say, well, they're averaging more yards per game on the ground than Ohio State. Well, okay, but we all know what Ohio State has been doing on the ground. And, you know, they had a 61-yarder against Notre Dame. And then on the other 25, 26 carries, they had you know, not much. So uh, it, it, it's weird how things kind of work with Maryland. And one of the big things that I had in my piece – as I was breaking down Tonga Valoa is I think everybody views him as like this huge dynamic dual threat quarterback. And he's, he's not, um, he does not run a lot. Now he does have an offense to where he can read the keys and he can pull it down and he can run. And he already has three rushing touchdowns this season through five games. His career high is four. And that was last year. I mean, he's averaging almost five yards per carry, but, he also averages just a couple runs per game. So, you know, don't don't sleep on what he's doing there, but they don't have, you know, Roman Hemby is not Anthony McFarland. And, you know, I know that's a bad name to bring up here. People remember that game, Ohio State. Love that play so much. They they let it go multiple times uh, in, in, in that game. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how Jim Knowles tries to scheme up what it is that Mike Loxley wants to do. You know, we talked about last year, well, Jim Knowles bakes in five, three, however many big plays. Well, Maryland wants to have 12 explosive plays. Well, I want to have the winning Powerball ticket. Uh, I think Mike Loxley's closer to his goal than I am to my goal. But um, it's, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to, I mean, I'm going to be interested to see where they attack. And you bring up Ty Felton. And his, you know, buck 40 or whatever, three touchdowns. There was only three touchdowns on the season. He just happened to be the hot hand, but they do a really good job of spreading the ball around. They don't have one guy or two guys that they they focus on. It's it's much more of an ensemble type of situation than when they had Raheem Jarrett and guys like that. Yeah, they've got a handful of guys that – like four guys with between 18 and 19 catches on the team right now and a couple guys be- behind them. Last year against Ohio State, Maryland had eight plays of 20 yards or more from scrimmage. This year, through four games, Ohio State has given up nine total 20-yard plays. So uh, this is a different Ohio State defense, but this may be the most uh, explosive offense that they've placed in terms of outside and downfield. And I'm with Kevin. Like You're not going to see Talia Tungabailo. He's not going to run it necessarily. He's not part of the running game, but he is part of keeping the passing game alive which is what concerns Day and Jim Knowles and talking about sending a lone blitzer after Talia Tungavailo and how easily he can just make that guy miss and be it a linebacker, be it a safety, whatever. He has that ability to sidestep a defender and then create after that because he's looking to create downfield because he's got good receivers. He doesn't need to take any hits. We all know Tungavailoas have been hit enough as children. They don't need to be hit on the football field, you know, and plus they get hit and they break. So, He's looking to get rid of the ball, and that's where he's at his best. And that's I think that's going to be the interesting thing to watch in this because the secondary hasn't been tested like this in terms of the uh, the length of time that they'll need to cover and the different breaking routes, the the scramble drills that they're going to have to cover. So this will be an interesting test for them to to uh, to handle. Another um, thought I have that uh, isn't necessarily backed up by anything that I can prove, but. Maryland is number two in the nation in turnover margin. Uh, Their defense has forced 12 in the last four games. The Buckeyes don't turn it over. It's typically my thought in these situations is that heavy turnover benefited teams prey on the weak, prey on the, you know, the irresponsible with the football, as opposed to being able to continue that trend against teams that can protect the football. And so that might be a good omen for the Buckeyes on Saturday. Yeah. McCord, I think what is only thrown the one interception and that was, uh, well, it looks like, Oh, Brown threw one as well uh, in his limited amount of time. So uh, yeah, uh, they're not going to turn it over. They haven't been turning it over. Uh, so they don't create any turnovers either, though. So that they they continue to not create turnovers. So um, that would be something nice, you know. You, you bring in an SEC defensive back like Igbenosa, and you hope you know that you get a few turnovers here or there. But uh, 
haven't materialized yet. Maybe this will be the week. Uh, although you know, uh, you know, Tylea, you know, at times has been prone to that. But we'll see if uh, the Buckeyes can can force one or two this week. But yeah, uh, not turning it over, um, particularly in this era of going from twelve possessions a game down to eight or nine, uh, is just so critical right now. I think. Well, you also look at the situation. How many 50-50 balls are being thrown against Ohio State? Um, you look at the Notre Dame game. There were a couple of near interceptions going both ways, honestly. But uh, yep. we, we saw JT Tuamolo almost have one of his Penn State-esque type of interceptions. There was another one who was was it was a Tyleek that had it hit him in the hands or, you know, so – we we do i mean sudden changes like that short fields are all well and good but i you know if ohio state can get get its opponent off the field on third down on you know three and outs or or short drives and maybe take eight possessions up to 10 possessions that's you know that's going to do a lot more for me there than 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 anything else and you look at who Maryland's played, and they have eight interceptions, but Noah Kim has thrown six already. I mean, I'm sure he threw a couple against Maryland there. They played Indiana, so I assume they played against Taven Jackson, who has not exactly been lighting the world on fire. UVA needs to be sent down to double A at this point. Towson is Towson. I mean, it's we talk about, you know, just to, to Steve's opening comments about it being criminal that Maryland is not ranked which I do agree with him there. I do. I think that they should be in that 23, 24, 25 slot rather than 26. They have played less than nobody. Yeah, I, I will say, Mark, to your point about Ohio State not turning the ball over this season, that's Notre Dame's fault for not catching those passes. That's number one. If they catch some passes <laughs> from Kyle McCord, they're creating some turnovers. But you know, Talia Tungabailoa, the last two years against Ohio State, is completing 72% of his passes, is, you know, Threw two interceptions in 2021 against them, none last year. So uh, I think they're going. There will be opportunities. He creates some opportunities for interceptions, just as Kyle McCord has. But you have to take advantage of them. And I do think, uh, you know, what does Maryland need to win that turnover margin by to make this a game in the fourth quarter? Does it need to be two? Does it need to be three? Or it doesn't need to be as many anymore because, as Steve said, possessions are fewer now. So, like you're already turning you're already like basically ohio state is minus two just because of the loss of possessions they go into every game now minus two almost and so they have to um just be more efficient as ryan day has said like every play every third down is bigger now because of the lack of possessions was there really that many passes that Notre Dame could have caught. Of course, the one that everyone thinks of is the tipped ball down the middle on the final drive that I don't know that that was dropped. That would have been a very difficult catch for a linebacker to make safety. I don't remember the safety safety. That one, you know, that was, that was a tough catch, but it was, it was through his hands. There was the, um, there's one the, going in the other direction that I remember there. And there was one to uh, Marvin in the end zone that, um, Benjamin Morrison had it right on his hip and you know it was a low throw so I, I've seen some people say you know, there there are five throws there are like five throws that Notre Dame got their hands on but they were I, I think they could have came away came away with the two interceptions in that game and it, it would not have been a shock and you're saying that would have changed that route that Ohio State had into a like a Notre Dame win well um, an interception on the last drive might have changed some things there, Mark, uh, in, in my opinion. Possible. 